Hello everyone, I am Dr. Parimal Fouquet. I am one of the directors and consultant radiologist at Precision Scan and Research Center in Nagpur. Today we are going to discuss the imaging of brachial plexus. The clinical investigations of peripheral nerve lesions routinely involve nerve conduction studies and EMG. The role of imaging is traditionally limited to excluding focal nerve lesions or extensive compressions. MRI, because of its excellent soft tissue imaging, can identify structural changes in the nerves as well as the secondary neurogenic pulsations which occur in skeletal muscles. This greatly enhances its use in differential diagnosis of peripheral nerve disease. Before moving on to the imaging part, let us first devise the cross-sectional anatomy of our peripheral nerve. Each peripheral nerve has got a covering called epineurium, inside which there are multiple bundles of fascicles which are separated by the intervening fat as shown here. Each fascicle has got a covering or sheath called as perineurium and inside which there are multiple bundles of myelinated axons. These axons are separated by thin sheets called as endoneurium. So we got endoneurium, the perineurium, and the epineurium. This is a fat saturated T2 weighted image of sciatic nerve, which clearly shows this anatomy. These small hyperintense areas are the nerve fascicles, which are in turn separated by these black dots, which is the suppressed fat, intervening fat between the fascicles. This is a fat saturated sequence, so the fat is going to appear black here. When we speak of nerve injuries, we generally follow the sedon and uh, single line classification, which divides nerve injuries in different categories, going on from the least severe to the most severe. We have got Neuropraxia, axontomasis, neurontomasis, and nerve transaction. The simplest of injury is neuropraxia, which means nerve stretching or edema. There is no loss of continuity in the axons, the axons are intact. The myelin sheath around the axon might be disrupted, but the uh, epineurium, the endoneurium, and the perineurium all are intact. These patients potentially have got rapid and complete recovery with no need of surgery. They don't have any sequelae of malignant degeneration. Moving on to the next type, which is slightly more severe, axontomesis. In axontomesis, we have got partial disruption of some of the axons. The endoneurium might be disrupted, however, the nerve fascicles are intact and the perineurium is intact. So, these patients will have some mild neurodeficit. Most of them will have complete recovery. Some of them will have mild neurodeficits. Uh, again, surgery is not largely indicated in these patients. Moving on to the next type, the neurontomesis. Now, this is a slightly severe form of injury in which there is partial nerve tear. So there will be disruption of the axons as well as some of the nerve fascicles. There will be breach in the endoneurium as well as the perineurium, right? But the epineurium will be intact, so the nerve structure is generally maintained. These are patients who will need surgery many a times. Uh, they might have some permanent neurodeficit and a sequelae of valerian degeneration. And moving on to the most severe type, nerve transaction, there will be complete breach in the continuity of the nerve so that there is break in the epineurium, right? These are patients who will require surgery immediately after the injury. To have a good recovery. So these patients are likely to have a uh, permanent neurodeficit and a sequelae of valerian degeneration. So why do we need to do imaging of patients with brachial plexus injury? And uh, what do we tell the surgeons after doing the imaging? So this is a illustration showing the different forms of injury. The image on the bottom here shows neuropraxia. The nerve rootlets are intact. The nerve itself is intact. When there is some stretch in the axons or edematous string in the nerve, these patients have got complete recovery. Second image here, shows axontomesis. There is partial disruption of some of the axons. However, the nerve epineurium is intact. The other patients will generally have got some deficit, but uh, good recovery is possible. Surgery is generally not indicated for these patients. The third image here, we can see that there is complete nerve transaction. So this is a severe form of injury. This will be severe axon uh, neurotomesis or nerve transaction. There is a complete breach in the epineurium. Again, these are the patients who should be subjected to the early surgery to have a good uh, prognosis. The fourth image here shows what we call as nerve root avulsion. So you can see that the ventral nerve uh, rootlets here are avulsed from the insertion on the cord. These again are patients who will need surgery on an urgent basis to have, uh, to have good prognosis. So when we do imaging of these of the patients with brachial plexus injury, almost 10% of patients will have got severe injury in the form of nerve root avulsion or nerve transaction. And almost 90% of patients will have got se uh, less severe or minor injury in the form of neuropraxia or axonomasis. So these 90% of patients generally don't need surgery, 70% of them will have complete recovery and around 30% will have some neurodeficit. But the whole uh, idea of imaging patients with brachial plexus injury is to identify this 10% of patient who will need surgery and uh, who can be afforded with prognosis after surgery. The acute axon nerve lesions cause a T2 hyperintense signal at and distal to the lesion site. This correlates with valerian degeneration and nerve edema. Prolongation of the T2 reduction time and gradual enhancement of denominated muscle develop in parallel to the development of spontaneous activity on EMG. And uh, these are the consequences of capillary enlargement and uh, 
increase the muscular blood volume. Similarly, when we do imaging of these patients, we also see changes of muscle denervation. Uh, these can be acute denervation, muscle denervation, or chronic muscle denervation. And how do we differentiate these? So, acutely denervated muscles show prolongation of T2 denervation time. There will be increased intensity on T2 and star images. The muscle volume is relatively maintained. Whereas in chronically denervated skeletal muscles, there is atrophy and fatty degeneration. And uh, these muscles will show increased intensity on T1 weighted images. These are patients, two different patients with two sequential episodes of foot drop affecting the peroneal nerve distribution. The first image here shows a axial T1 weighted image, and in the peroneus brevis muscle, we are seeing there is hyperintense signal here which suggests fatty degeneration. So this is chronic muscle denervation. Second image, second patient here shows there is edematous changes and slightly increased volume in the peroneus longus muscle. It is hyperintense here on an actual fat saturated situated image, suggesting muscle edema and acute muscle denervation. The mental technique of brachial plexus imaging and the sequences that we take, both 1.5 Tesla and 3 Tesla MRI machines are good. But as we know, 3 Tesla MRI scores over 1.5 Tesla in terms of vessel signal to resistance ratio and availability of newer 3D imaging sequences. We use specialized RF coils, surface coils or phase direct coils are used. T1 weighted images are good to show detailed anatomy and they are used to define the bony structures and tissue planes surrounding the nerves. High resolution, fast pinnacle T2 images are good to practice pathology. Fat separation techniques using uh, FS sequences or STIR sequence, these will detect early changes of edema inflammation and they will make the pathology more conspicuous. GAD enhanced T1 weighted imaging is useful for evaluation of peripheral nerve tumors, plus infiltration, and uh, in identifying idiopathic inflammatory disorders like uh, partially skeletal syndrome and so on. And very importantly, three Tesla MR neurography. So when we speak of MR neurography, we mean to take 3D sequences like 3D STIR sequence, 3D GRE, and nowadays 3D different sequences. So this enhances the imaging and uh, will help us in getting reformat images. What are the imaging planes that we take when we image the brachial plexus? Now we have to keep in mind that the imaging plane should parallel the nerve, course of the nerves. So when we take a coronal sequence, this is oblique coronal, this is the actual slice here. We are going to take the plane which parallels the nerves as they exit from the neural foramen and traverse anterolaterally towards the axilla. So this is the imaging plane to get the coronal images. Similarly, for actual image, the imaging plane should go laterally and inferiorly because the nerve, this is the course of the nerves. And on sagittal, the imaging plane should cut the nerves at right angles. So if the nerves are passing in this direction, the imaging plane should be so that the nerves are cut in right angles. Coming to the anatomy of brachial plexus, we know that when we speak of brachial plexus, we speak in terms of roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. But when we come to roots, we have to speak in two terms, preganglionic part and the postganglionic part. So what does that mean? So this is a illustration. This is, say this is a C5 root section. So this is a ventral rootlet of C5 nerve. This is the dorsal or the posterior rootlet. Both of them join here to form the C5 nerve. Just before joining, the dorsal or the posterior rootlet has got a ganglion. This is the dorsal ganglion. So the part before the ganglion is the preganglionic part, the part here colored in green. So this is the ventral rootlet, dorsal rootlet, the ganglion. This comprises the preganglionic segment. And the part in orange is the postganglionic segment. So this is the C5 nerve itself. And then it divides into the ventral ramus and dorsal ramus. So we have to keep in mind that only the ventral rami of C5, C6, C7, C8 and T1 nerves will comprise or will uh, take part in formation of the brachial plexus. The posterior rami will not take part in the brachial plexus. Sometimes we have got contributions from the C4 nerve and the D2 nerve. So this is the action. It is very important to image this part also. Generally, when we do brachial plexus imaging, we tend to forget to take actual sections or 3D sequences to evaluate the rootlets. So we have to take a 3D space or fiesta sequence. CMS machine will have a space sequence or a set sequence, and the G machine will have a fiesta sequence. So take a 3D space or fiesta through the exiting neural front. So this is the image here, which shows the ventral rootlet on the right side. So this is the right ventral rootlet, the posterior rootlet. These join together to form the exiting nerve here. This nerve again will divide it to the ventral remus and the posterior remus. In nerve root avulsion, we will see that this segment is lost and there will be a formation of a pseudomeningocele in this region. We will come to these images later. Yeah. So this is a patient who has got nerve root avulsions involving right-sided C5 to C8 nerves. So we have taken actual 3D space or fiesta sequence here. So this is at the level of C5 nerve root. We can see that the ventral and the dorsal rootlets are seen on the left side, but they are not seen on the right side. Again, same at the level of neural foramen, the C5 
the left sided root heads are seen, the right sided root is not seen here. Same is the case at C6 level. At C7 level, same thing here. And additionally, we are seeing that there's a cystic area here in the epidural space in the lateral recess and neural foramen on the right side. This is, in fact, a pseudomeningocele. So, this is a classical case of neurodiversion with pseudomeningocele formation on the right side. At the D1 level, we can see both the ventral and dorsal rootlets on the right and left side here. So, the D1 rootlets or the roots are intact. 